Before ascending into heaven, the Lord Jesus directed his disciples by declaring, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's right, the Lord Jesus Christ has encouraged every Christian. He's commissioned us to go into the world preaching the gospel of grace to every single person. And it was in response to this great commission that the apostle Paul once declared, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. With that, I would ask you this morning, is that your heart? Are you of the same mind and are you of the same conviction as the apostle Paul that you would say, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel? It's sad to say that most Christians here in the modern church don't share Paul's conviction. And the reason I say this is due to the fact that the majority of those who profess to follow Jesus Christ rarely, if ever, share the gospel message with the unbelievers within their sphere of influence. In order to prove my point, I would appeal to a poll which was conducted by LifeWay Research. According to their investigation, 80% of those those of us who attend church one or more times a month, we agree that we have a personal responsibility to share our faith. And yet 61% of those on the same poll uh, admitted that they hadn't presented the gospel of grace to anyone in the past six months. 61% of those polled had not once shared the gospel of grace with an unbeliever in a six-month period of time. And in light of this research, it seems clear to me that the majority of those who profess to follow the Lord Jesus Christ have no desire to fulfill his command to go into the world and preach the gospel. If this sounds like something that you struggle with, then I'm happy to inform you that we're going to spend our time today considering the importance of properly preaching the gospel of grace. And as we make our way through our text today, we'll soon discover that proper preaching points people to the faith that we should place in the gospel of salvation. Secondly, we'll learn that proper preaching points people to the fall of spiritual fornication Thirdly and finally today, we'll learn that proper preaching points people to the fear of wrathful indignation. Well, with this as our outline, let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 14, where we find the Apostle John. He's presenting the proclamations of three angelic messengers. And as you're making your way to Revelation chapter 14, I want to continue setting the stage for our text today by first reminding you that we've been in the middle of a parenthetical passage which was placed between the sixth trumpet judgment and the seventh. And while this parenthetical pause presents us with a great deal of additional information about the tribulation, John here seems to be placing the final bracket on that parenthesis here in our text today. With this in mind, if you would, let's turn our attention to Revelation chapter 14. We're going to begin our study at verse 6. Here John declares, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And, they, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Here in our text today, we find John, he's presenting his audience with the threefold message which was being proclaimed by three different angels. But before we examine their messages, uh, we should notice that John here is introducing the first messenger as another angel. 
it's important to understand that the word another was actually translated from a Greek word, which means another of the same kind. And so he's telling us that this angel is another, which is just like an angel who had come previously. And in this way, John seems to be drawing a chronological connection between this angel and the previous angel that he described back in chapter 8, just before he interrupted the timeline with the parenthetical pause, which began in chapter 10. Now, in order to further make my case, I should point out here that both angels, the one in chapter 8 and the one here in chapter 14, they're both described as being angels who are flying in the midst of heaven. And while the flying angel, which is found back in chapter 8, announced the last three trumpet judgments, this first flying angel, which is found here in our text today, appears to be presenting the world with one last chance for salvation, uh, especially after the abomination of desolation, which will occur in the middle of the tribulation. And with that being the case, it only stands to reason that the three angels that we find here in our text today uh, seem to arrive on the scene shortly after the seventh trumpet is sounded and the Antichrist commits the abomination of desolation. Well, now that we have a grasp on the timeline here, let's focus our attention on the message of this first angel. If you would look with me again there at verse 6, because here again John writes that, uh, that he saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, and notice that he has the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Now, here in this verse, we find this first angel, the first of the three, proclaiming what John calls the everlasting gospel. For the sake of clarity, it'll help you to know that the word gospel, it simply means good news. He's proclaiming the everlasting good news. And it's important to understand that it's the everlasting good news and not some sort of finite good news. I, I'm certain that we would all agree that there's lots of good news that we would love to hear. For example, when you get that letter in the mail that lets you know that you've possibly won the Clearinghouse uh, Sweepstakes Award, you know, that would be good news, right, if you actually won it. But is that everlasting good news? And the answer is no, no. Earthly riches are not everlasting good news. This is everlasting good news. And in order to further grasp the everlasting good news of the gospel message, if you would hold your place here in Revelation and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. As you make your way to 1 Corinthians 15, I want to take a moment to point out that the good news of the everlasting gospel, it points us to a promised Savior who came to provide us with a way to escape the punishment which we all deserve. We all deserve this punishment because we're all sinners. And so the gospel message gives us the good news that though we are sinners, there's a Messiah, a promised Savior who has came to provide us a way of escape. In other words, the gospel message is centered around the sacrifice of the promised Messiah who was prophetically revealed in the writings of the Old Testament prophets. And in order to prove my point, let's consider something that Paul wrote to the Christians there in Corinth. If you would look with me at 1 Corinthians 15. We'll begin reading at verse 1 because there Paul declares, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now here in these verses, we find Paul summarizing the everlasting gospel by, uh, by which we can be saved. And according to Paul here, the gospel message, it centers around the salvific work of our Savior, which includes his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And not only did Paul present his audience with a brief summary of the everlasting gospel, which is centered around the work of Jesus Christ, he also reminds us that this all took place there in the first century, all according to prophecies that are found in the Old Testament scriptures. Notice again there in the text, we learn that in verse 3, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And verse 4, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You might not know this, but the God of Israel prophetically revealed the everlasting gospel in the pages of the Old Testament. 
As a matter of fact, there are actually hundreds of Old Testament prophecies which reveal the ministry of the promised Messiah. The Old Testament is filled with prophecies that point to Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus even confirmed this fact in John chapter 5 when he challenged the unbelieving Jews by declaring, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and these are they which testify of me. In other words, the everlasting gospel, which centers around the work of the Messiah, which includes his death, burial, and resurrection, uh, this gospel message was already revealed through the prophecies that are found in the Old Testament. And we would do well to point people, much like Paul did, to those prophecies. We would do well to help them to see all of the Old Testament prophecies, which revealed the ministry of our promised Messiah. And while it's true that the good news of the gospel message centers around the salvific work of our Savior, it's also true that the spiritual benefits of his sacrifice are received by those who will simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in order to prove my point, continue to hold your place there in the book of Revelation, but turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. You see, it's in Ephesians 2 where we find the Apostle Paul. He's helping the Christians there at the church in Ephesus to understand that the Lord Jesus has already accomplished the work which is necessary for our salvation. Therefore, Paul assured his audience that the forgiveness of sins is actually a free gift of grace which is received by our faith. Let's consider how Paul puts it here in Ephesians chapter 2. If you would look with me beginning at verse 8. Here Paul declares, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now here in these verses, we find Paul helping his audience to understand that the everlasting gospel of grace is, is, is actually great news. It's not just good news, it's great news. And the reason why is due to the fact that the Lord Jesus has already accomplished the good work which is necessary for our salvation. The work is finished. It's for this very reason that the Lord Jesus there on the cross declared, it is finished, account paid in full. It's not partially finished. It's not almost finished. It's not mostly finished except for a few things that you have to do. It is finished. With that being the case, we have to understand that the Lord isn't asking us to work our way into his good graces. No, instead, he's inviting us to receive the free gift of grace, which results in the forgiveness of our sins and to receive it by faith, and by faith alone. Sadly, there are many who have distorted the everlasting gospel of grace, and they've done this by attempting to convince us that there are still good works which we must accomplish in order to be forgiven. And knowing that there will be many who will come along and pervert the gospel of grace, well, Paul presented us with a strong word of warning. And with this as our focus, continue holding your place there in the book of Revelation. But I'd like you now to turn with me to Galatians chapter 1. You see, it's in Galatians 1 where we find the Apostle Paul. He's addressing the Christians who were there at the church of Galatia. And he recognized that they were beginning to embrace a false gospel, a perverted gospel, which was being presented to them by a group of spiritual charlatans who were preaching faith plus works. In light of this context, if you would look with me there at Galatians chapter 1, we'll begin reading at verse 6. Here Paul declares, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to, notice, a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. 
here in these verses, we find the Apostle Paul helping his audience to understand that the gospel message is based upon the grace of Christ. Jesus has called us into his grace, and that's good news. Because as I've already pointed out, the grace of Christ is a free gift, which is received by faith in the sacrifice of our Savior, Jesus. And when I say free gift, I mean free gift. If I came along and I said, hey, I've got this awesome free gift that I'd like to give you, but I can't give it to you until after you wash my truck. Is that a gift? Or or, or is that being earned? If you can't receive this free gift until you wash my truck, then I'm making you work for it. It's no longer a gift. You can't say that's a gift. That's a paycheck. Grace is a gift. The forgiveness of Jesus Christ is a free gift, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Therefore, the gospel of grace tells us that the free gift of forgiveness is received by faith and not of works, not even one work. It's sad to say that there are many false teachers who have come along and perverted the gospel of grace. They've distorted this message by adding works to faith. They want you to believe that it's faith plus. It's faith plus water baptism. Well, now you've got to work. That's a different gospel than what Paul preached. Okay, it's, it, it's faith plus these sacraments. It's faith plus communion. That's a work. It's no longer the same gospel message. It's perverted. And it's sad to say that there are some people who have been deceived because an angel came to them and said, well, I'd I'd like to embellish. I'd like to add a little bit here to what you've already learned. And sure, you have the Old and the New Testament, but there's, there's more revelation coming. And God sent me, an angel, to come and tell you this and that. This is exactly what Muhammad tells us that an angel came to him with more information. This is exactly what Joseph Smith says, that an angel came to him with more information. And so it's the Bible plus this additional information, which means that it's the gospel of grace, which is faith, and then plus these works. It's deception. And people are falling into it because, well, an angel told them. Paul says if anybody comes along, even an angel tells you any other gospel, let them be accursed, anathema. The Lord has clearly given us everything we need to understand about the gospel of grace. And so even if an angel comes to us or any person and gives us faith plus anything, we know that it's deception. And it's sad to say that the world is filled with people who have been deceived and it's just going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And while we can be uh, happy that the church is here to preach the gospel in this day and age, there's coming a day in the tribulation when the Christian church won't be here. But God's not going to leave them without a witness. He's going to send two witnesses. He's going to raise up 144,000 Jews who are going to go out and evangelize. And not only that, but he's going to send this angel to proclaim the everlasting gospel. He's going to send this angel who will proclaim the everlasting gospel of grace to those who dwell on the earth, which includes every nation, every tribe, every tongue, and every people. In this way, the Lord is going to give people one last chance to receive the grace of God by faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus. He's going to share with them the good news about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And according to John, the angel who proclaims this everlasting gospel is going to take the time to point people to the God of all creation. But this is our focus. Let's make our way back to Revelation chapter 14. I'd like you to look with me again at verse 7. Here we learn that the angel declares with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. And notice, worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Here in this verse, we find this first angel. He's commanding every person to worship the creator of the universe. Not only that, but this angel was also connecting the everlasting gospel of grace to the belief in biblical creationism. He's going to proclaim the everlasting gospel, and as he does, he's going to command everyone to worship the creator. 
Now, just to be clear, biblical creationism is based on the belief that everything in the entire universe was specially and specifically designed and created by God. And according to God's word, he accomplished this creation in six literal days. Now, I realize that this is a very unpopular thing to say, even amongst Christians. And there are those who would be like, oh, you know, how can you believe in a God who, who creates in six literal days when... Well, wait a minute. Is God all-powerful or not? And if God is all-powerful, couldn't he create the entire universe in six seconds? And the answer is yes, of course he could. He could create the entire universe in six billion years too. The question isn't what could he have done, but what did he do? And where would we go for that answer? And I would point you to Genesis chapter 1, the creation account, where God reveals through Moses how he did it, that he created the entire universe in six literal days. Sad to say that so many Christians have allowed atheistic scientists to convince them uh, to believe in the theory of evolution. That's right, evolution is not a scientific fact. It is a theory, and I would even suggest barely that. And as the world watches the church turning its back on the creation account found in Genesis chapter 1, well, the logical deduction is, why should they believe in any other chapter? If Christians don't believe in Genesis chapter 1, why should unbelievers believe in John chapter 3? It doesn't make sense. If Christians are ready to throw out a chapter of the Bible, well, then it's not the word of God. And so why should unbelievers believe in anything found in the Bible if we can't believe in a six-day creation as revealed by God? Not only that, but I would simply appeal to the scientific arguments of those scientists who believe in biblical creationism. You know, there's many, many scientists who are quick to present arguments for a young earth and they're quick to present scientific arguments for the creation account, which is found in Genesis chapter one. That being the case, I would encourage every Christian to learn how to scientifically defend Genesis chapter one so that we can properly preach the gospel message. If we can help people to understand that there are good scientific reasons to embrace Genesis chapter one, then they might embrace John chapter three. We need to help people believe in the infinite creator so that they might accept the everlasting gospel. When I was a college pastor at Calvary Austin, I would lead an outreach to the University of Texas uh, during their annual 40-acre festival. This is when all the campus clubs were given a, uh, a plot a little area to set up a booth and and there were supposed to be carnival style booths and kids would come out and it would be a big celebration. But we would always go and set up a booth that had a big sign above it that said, free chance to win $100. And you know, college kids want to win $100. And so we would have a long line of, of people trying to win $100. But here's how they did it. We would have a cup, which I called the Big Bang Simulator, and in this Big Bang simulator, we would have a bunch of Dungeons and Dragons dice, which, which had uh, you know, specific colors that would line up to a depiction of a DNA strand, which was on the table. And all they had to do was spill the cup over, uh, letting the, the dice randomly fly onto the table. And if the colors and the numbers all matched this DNA strand, then they would win $100. I did this for five years. And not once did I ever give away $100. Not once. Many kids would uh, quickly get the point, which was simply this. Random chance will never produce human DNA. Therefore, there must be a creator God. Inevitably, though, there would be some who would insist that, well, you know, given enough time, if they could sit out there all day long rolling those dice, then eventually they would you know, produce the the right combination. And I would say, well, feel free. Let's continue rolling. And I would hand them back the Big Bang Simulator without the dice. And they would say, well, give me the dice. And I would say, oh, no, no. Let's make this a little bit more real. 
to how things actually happened. Let's wait for the dice to evolve from the air in that cup. And they would get it. At that point, they would get it. And I would hold up my hand and ask him, what do I have in my hand right now? Nothing. Well, how long do I have to wait before that becomes something? Nothing will always produce nothing. And because there is something, then there has to be an infinite something that created everything. And because something includes the minds of you and I, then there must be an infinite mind who has created every other finite mind. Very simple argument. And those kids would get it. And as a result, they would be open to hearing the gospel message. Once we help them to see the evidence for the infinite creator, they were more open to hearing the everlasting gospel. Now, I'm sure we all know people who have rejected the everlasting gospel of grace simply because they believe in this theory of evolution. And with that being the case, I would encourage you to bone up on this topic. You ought to spend time looking at arguments for creationism. Spend time on websites like Answers in Genesis or ICR.org. ICR stands for Institute for Creation Research. Both of those websites have phenomenal arguments and articles which will help you to understand the evidence is actually on our side. The evidence actually supports the creation account found in Genesis chapter 1. We don't have to hide from this but we can stand with all boldness on scientific arguments that support the creation account. As we are equipped with these arguments, we'll be better equipped to preach properly the everlasting gospel by pointing people to the scientific arguments which support the truths that we find in the Bible. And while the first point of proper preaching will focus on uh, presenting people with the faith that we should place in the gospel of salvation, uh, our second point is based on the idea that proper preaching should always point people to the fall of spiritual fornication. And with this as our focus, I'd like to make our way back to Revelation chapter 14. If you would look with me there at verse 8. Here John tells us that another angel followed saying, Babylon has fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, in order to understand this proclamation that this, uh, that's being presented by the second angel, it will first help us to understand what he was talking about when he refers to that great city, which is called Babylon. According to a prophecy expert by the name of John Walverd, Babylon sometimes refers to a literal city, sometimes to a religious system, sometimes to a political system, all stemming from the evil character of historic Babylon. Or to put it simply, the topic of Babylon has many different implications, which all deserve our attention. And listen, when we get to Revelation chapter 17 and 18, we're going to spend a great deal of time examining the prophetic nature of this great city that John mentions here in Revelation chapter 14. But for now, I simply want to identify the city of Babylon according to the description that John presents to us here in verse 8. And so if you would look with me again there in the second half of verse 8, because there John tells us that Babylon has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, It'll help us to remember that in our study last week, we considered the 144,000 and we considered their virginity. And as we looked at the virginity of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists, we also learned that the word virginity can actually refer to the spiritual purity of those who are committed to Christ and therefore abstain from the sin of idolatry. And so in contrast to the spiritual virginity of the 144,000, consider now the word fornication and how it's being used against Babylon. The fornication of Babylon reveals the religious idolatry of this world system. In light of this, it'll help you to know that the city of Babylon was actually founded by a man named Nimrod. And Nimrod who was actually the grandson of Noah, Nimrod was so angry with God for flooding the earth that he began a new religious system which centered around a false god named Bel, or in the Hebrew, Baal. 
Not only that, but Nimrod also appointed himself the priest of his new religion. And as the alleged priest of Baal, he commissioned the people of the earth who were all gathered together in the same place at that point in time. He commissioned them to build a tower into the heavens. This is the Tower of Babel. And with this tower, he, he was planning to defend themselves against the God who had flooded the earth. The first century Jewish historian whose name is Josephus, he confirms this in his writings by declaring, now it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. He also said he would be revenged on God if he should have a mind to drown the world again. For that he would build a tower too high for the waters to reach and that he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. And so we see that Nimrod had a plan to defend the earth against the next flood. And not only was Nimrod interested in creating a safe place for his people here on earth, but there's also reason to believe that he was attempting to attack the inhabitants of heaven. For example, there is a passage in the Jewish Talmud which tells us that Nimrod was attempting to wage war against the inhabitants of heaven. And based on these extra biblical sources, it seems to me that Nimrod was leading the world in rebellion against the God of Noah who had flooded the earth. As a result, well, the Lord decided to scatter all these people and he scattered the people throughout the earth by giving them different languages. And while it's true that this linguistic confusion caused them to divide up by languages and scatter out to the different nations of the earth, it's also true that the religious system of Nimrod it ended up becoming the basis for all religious idolatry throughout the entire world. Because as all these people scattered by language, they took with them the religious system of Baal, which Nimrod had created. This is precisely the point that the second angel is making here in verse 8 when he, when he declares that Babylon has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The fornication, which we would call spiritual adultery or idolatry, has been dispersed abroad from Babylon into all the nations of the world. And without debate, the religions of the world are all variations of the same spiritual fornication which began back in Babylon. In light of this, I want to take a moment to consider then what the second angel meant when he declared, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. In the most literal sense, I believe the, the angel is prophetically pointing to the destruction of Babylon, which will be described in greater detail when we get to Revelation chapter 17 and 18. Babylon has fallen in the sense that God is going to take down this whole political and religious system. And yet at the same time, I do believe that there is a much deeper spiritual meaning to this statement, which I believe was designed to remind us that every religious system which is created by fallen men is unable to grant us access into heaven. And the reason why is because Babylon has fallen. But this is our focus. I'd like you to hold your place here in the book of Revelation and turn with me now to Matthew chapter four. And as you make your way to the fourth chapter of Matthew's gospel account, I want to take a moment to point out that all of the man-made religions of this world not only trace back to Babylon, but you can go now past the flood and trace it all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Every man-made religious system found in the world today can be traced back to the Garden of Eden, which is where Satan deceived Eve into questioning the word of God, ultimately rejecting it so that she could seek the mystery wisdom, which comes from the fruit, which was growing on the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Eve then also convinced Adam to eat the fruit with her. And as a result, their sin resulted in the fall of man. And so when we're talking about something that's fallen, we're talking about those who have bowed a knee to the lies of Lucifer. As a matter of fact, with this in mind, look with me here at Matthew chapter four. We'll begin at verse eight because here Matthew tells us that the devil took Jesus up on exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you will, notice, fall down and worship me. Satan wanted Jesus to fall down and worship him. Remember, Jesus 
escaped the, the curse of the fall through his virgin birth. This was God the Father's way of introducing the Messiah into the world through an incarnation that escaped the fall of the curse, which is based on the seed of man. But Satan wanted to do his best to make sure that Jesus would become a fallen man, just like the rest of us. And so he said, I'll give you everything. It's all yours. If you would simply fall down and worship me. Jesus said in response there in verse 10, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Those who are fallen worship false gods. Therefore, we must repent of that so that we can worship the true God and his Messiah, Jesus Christ. It's also interesting to note that the words fall down found there in verse 9 They're translated from the same Greek word that the angel used in Revelation 14 when he told the apostle John that Babylon is fallen. The word fallen there, same Greek word as what's being used here by Satan when he tells Jesus to fall down and worship him. In this sense, then, we can see that Babylon is fallen because it's a religious system which has been created by those who are willing to fall down before the fallen angel known as the devil. And with that being the case, the second point of proper preaching is designed to not only expose the fallen state of mankind, which can be traced back to the sin of Adam and Eve, but also the fallen state of spiritual fornication, which can be seen in the religious idolatry that's found in every single man-made religion. Or more simply put, we've been called to help people to understand that there's only one way to be saved, and Jesus Christ is the only way. There's only one savior of fallen men and it's the Lord Jesus Christ who took our place on the cross and and paid for our sins by dying for them on the cross. Now I realize that this message is going to be offensive, especially to those who have the coexist bumper sticker on the back of their car because they want all the world religions to, to equally represent God, but they don't. All the world religions... Yeah, they all lead to the same God. And his name is Lucifer. He's a false God. And he's lied to fallen men so that we might fall down and worship him. But that's all they can do. Those world religions, those fallen religious systems, they can't get us to heaven. And while I realize that this is offensive to those who embrace spiritual pluralism or religious pluralism, It's important for us to help them to understand that every man-made religious system is nothing more than a reflection and an echo of fallen Babylon. Therefore, man-made religions, well, it's nothing more than man's attempt to build a tower up to God. That's what man-made religions are. Man's attempt to build a tower up to God. And while the fallen religions of this world are leading people to believe that they have to work their way to heaven, we can remind them that the Lord Jesus has already accomplished the work. He's done. He's finished. The work for our salvation was accomplished there on the cross, and that's great news. Now, this brings us to our third point, because listen, proper preaching not only points people to the faith that we place in the gospel of salvation, and it not only exposes the fall of spiritual fornication, which can be seen in every man-made religion, But proper preaching will also point people to the fear of wrathful indignation as we consider the wrath of God. In order to explain what I'm saying, if you would, let's make our way back to Revelation chapter 14. And I want to pick up our study uh, there at verse 9. Here again, John writes, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now, Here in these verses, we find this third angel. He's warning the world about the righteous wrath of God, which will eventually come upon those who worship the beast and his image. And according to this angel, those who embrace the fallen religious system of the Antichrist, which includes the mark of the beast, which they're going to receive, those who receive that mark are going to end up drinking the wine of the wrath of God. 
That doesn't sound good. The wine of the wrath of God is not a drink you want to consume. And yet this angel tells us that this wine is going to be poured out full strength, uncut, into the cup of his indignation. Now that word indignation was translated from a Greek word which which speaks of the violent emotion of anger which arises in the hearts of a magistrate like a judge. So imagine a just judge sitting on his bench hearing about the the crimes of a criminal in front of him and and all of a sudden just feeling that, that violent emotion of anger as he desires to pass a perfect punishment on the lawbreaker. This is the sort of indignation which will fill the heart of God as he sits upon his judgment throne. And in order to grasp the horror of the Lord's righteous indignation, look with me again there in the middle of verse 10. Here the third angel declares, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice in verse 11, the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. Now the word torment found here in these verses It speaks of the agony and the affliction which is caused by the misery of torture. Grasp that for a moment. These people are going to be tormented with agony and affliction which rises up from the torture that they're going to experience there in hell. And according to this angel, the Lord is going to torment those who worship the beast with fire and brimstone. This, of course, is a reference to the lake of fire, which is the final destination of every unrepentant unbeliever, not just those who receive the mark of the beast. As a matter of fact, when we get to Revelation chapter 21, we're going to learn that the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, we might not be guilty of everything on this list. I guarantee that we're all guilty of some of it. And according to John, every liar who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ and does not repent of their sins will end up in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. Now, that's bad news for those who have yet to receive the grace of God because we've all lied. Therefore, we're all guilty. Now, as we consider the agony and the affliction which will be endured by those who receive the full cup of uncut wrath there in the lake of fire, it's no wonder why so many theologians are so quick to look for any other explanation and any other position rather than the doctrine of eternal torment. Because any other explanation is just so much easier to handle. For example, there are some who insist that the second death mentioned here by John is actually the annihilation of those who end up in the lake of fire. Or more simply put, they believe that the unrepentant unbeliever will eventually go to hell, uh, but then they'll simply cease to exist at some point in time. Yeah, that's much easier to believe than someone in eternal torment without end. But is that what the Bible says? There are those who believe that the Lord is going to give uh, the people who end up in the lake of fire more opportunities to repent. We, we see this lie in, in books like Love Wins by Rob Bell. This idea that eventually God is going to... <clears throat> uh, you know, basically uh, torment them until they finally you know, cry uncle. And that eventually they're going to be able to escape hell by receiving the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ, like there's another opportunity once they're in hell. In light of these popular positions, uh, which I'm sure we all agree would be much easier to, to, to teach rather than what we find here in our text. If you would look with me again there at verse 11, here we learn that the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. According to this angel, the evidence of their everlasting torment will be seen in this smoke which rises up for the, for the rest of eternity. And so the smoke is the evidence that there's torment continuing on forever and ever. And then some will say, well, what does forever and ever mean? Some make the argument, well, that's just an age, you know, until the end of that age. 
And then they want to pretend like, you know, that age will come to an end at some point in time. And so it'll be forever and ever in that age. And then that age is ended and then they're released. Well, if that's a position that you've been holding, consider what Jesus said in Mark chapter 9 when he described hell as being a place of eternal torment by saying that it's a place where the maggots never die and the fire never goes out. It seems to me that there's no end to this. The lake of fire is a place where the maggot continues to consume and, and those who are there will continue to be tormented forevermore through fire and brimstone. To further make my case, I want to consider something that Jesus said in Matthew 25, where he described the final judgment as a day when unbelievers will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Unbelievers will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Based on this, we can see that Jesus was making an apples to apples comparison between the eternal duration of heaven and the eternal duration of hell. And he used the same exact Greek word when he talked about eternal punishment and eternal life. It's the same word. That being the case, listen, if you believe that the Christian is going to enjoy the majesty and the glory and the pleasures of heaven for the rest of eternity, if that's something that you believe, then you must logically also believe that those who end up in hell will suffer the torment of God's indignation for the same amount of time. Sadly, there are many Christians who refuse to preach this message of eternal fire and brimstone. And the reason why is due to the fact that they just simply want to focus on the good news of the gospel message. Well, I don't want to talk about God's wrath and punishment. You know, I'd rather talk about God's love. I personally love telling people about the good news of God's love. I'd much rather just spend all my time letting people know, hey, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you. But I remember as an unbeliever, someone saying, hey, Jesus loves you. Well, great, then there's nothing to worry about. Jesus loves me. So, so what do I need to worry about if Jesus loves me? We need to help people to grasp the reality of everlasting torment, which will come upon those who reject the grace of God. We must help people to understand that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Because he will torment every unbeliever forevermore with fire and with brimstone. Now, if you think that's wrong to go around and encourage people to fear this God of torment, then I would simply point you back to the message of that first angel, which we see there in Revelation 14, verse 7. Notice again there where the first angel declares, Fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come. Now, here's an angel who stands in the presence of God and is sent with this special message. And he just got through preaching the everlasting good news and turns around and says, fear God. Because the day of his judgment, the hour of his judgment has come. We ought to encourage people much like this angel did to fear the righteous judge of heaven and earth. And the reason why is due to the fact the hour of his judgment is coming. And I like the way that the Lord Jesus put it in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, where he declared, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That word destroy, it simply speaks of something that has been ruined. It still exists, but it's no longer able to accomplish what it was designed for. And so there's coming a day when God is going to destroy every unbeliever in the fires of hell. They will continue to exist, but they just won't be used for what they were designed for, which is to praise the Lord and give him glory. But clearly the Lord Jesus was directing people to receive the good news of the gospel message by fearing God first. 
I realize that there will be people who accuse us of fear-mongering. Well, you just want, you know, to make people afraid of God. Why would we fear a God who loves us? Well, because the hour of his judgment is coming. And if you're not standing in the finished work of Jesus Christ, then you will be judged for every single sin. And I would even point out that it's not wrong to help people to fear God because remember the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. And even further, I would simply point out that most people here on earth are allowing fear to drive them to make many, many decisions. As a matter of fact, most people are living their lives under the phenomenon which we now know to be FOMO. If you're unfamiliar, FOMO is simply the fear of missing out. And many people today are living under FOMO. As a matter of fact, when I left church on Wednesday night, I walked outside and I saw a line of cars coming out of the Dairy Queen parking lot and it went all the way down to the light. And the reason why is because Dairy Queen was giving away free ice cream cones. And so people are going to sit there in this line burning gas until they can finally get up to the drive through to get their free ice cream cone, which costs probably about 50 cents. So they're gonna burn $3 worth of gas in order to get a 50 cent ice cream cone? Why? Fear of missing out. You could drive down to Jason's Deli and get a free ice cream cone every day of the week. And yet fear of missing out. Don't wanna miss out on this thing that everybody else is gonna be a part of. People are going to parties. They're going to, you know, concerts. They're, because it's a fear of missing out. Well, it's going to be awesome. Everybody's going to love it. We're all going to talk about it the next day. I want to be the person that's going, I wasn't there. Fear of missing out. In light of this, I would simply encourage you that we ought to be helping people to understand that the fear of missing out should be replaced by the fear of God's righteous wrath. We ought to help people to understand that they, they should have fear of missing out of, on going to heaven. Because if they miss out on going to heaven, they're going to hell. Christian, listen, there's coming a day when we're all going to stand before our creator. And on that day, uh, we learn that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you're an unbeliever here this morning, I'm here to let you know there's coming a day when you're going to bow a knee to Jesus and you will confess that he is Lord. Sadly, the unbeliever, after bowing a knee and confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord there at the judgment throne, will then turn around and hear Jesus declare, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell wasn't designed for man. Hell is designed for the devil and his angels. And yet, it's the only place left for those who reject the grace of God, which is received by faith in Jesus Christ. And with that being the case, I would encourage every Christian here this morning to have enough compassion to realize that there are people who will end up in hell forever if they don't receive the gospel message. And so we ought to become those preachers, those who go out and accomplish the great commission of Jesus Christ by pointing people to the faith that we place in the gospel of salvation, by pointing people to the fall of spiritual fornication, which is seen in every man-made religion, and by pointing people to the fear of wrathful indignation, knowing that there's coming a day when God will pour out his wrath on every unrepentant unbeliever. And it's a torment which will last Forever. Now, I realize that our call to preach the gospel to every person, it's an extremely tall order, and yet we must remember that this is the last command that the Lord Jesus gave to his disciples. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> it's in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where we find the Lord helping his disciples to understand their calling by declaring, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And after that, he ascended into heaven. This is the last thing that he told his disciples to do is to wait for the Holy Spirit to empower them so that they can go and become his witnesses. And this is exactly what he's commanded us to do, to be his witnesses, to patiently proclaim 
the good news. This is his command to us. And in light of this, I want to consider something that John said here in our text. Look with me there at Revelation chapter 14. I want you to focus in on verse 12 where John declares, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Christian, listen, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, then you will also have a deep desire to keep his commandments. We don't keep the commandments to get saved, but if you are saved, you will desire to keep his commandments. And one of his most important commandments was when he gave us that command to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Are you obeying that command? Are you preaching the gospel to every living creature? And with this question in mind, I would encourage you, let's accomplish our commission with great boldness. With this in mind, notice again at verse 7. There in Revelation 14, verse 7, the first angel said with a meek and timid, shy voice. Oh, no, that's not what it says. He said with a loud voice. Look again at verse 9. The third angel followed them saying with a loud voice. They weren't apologetic. They, they, they weren't trying to hide it. They weren't shy about it. It was with a loud voice. The the words loud voice come from the Greek words megasphone or megaphone. And I'm not suggesting that we all go out and buy megaphones today and stand on street corners yelling at people. And no, I, I think that the, that word loud could mean so much more than just the volume of their voice. That, that word loud speaks of power. It speaks of strength. It speaks of boldness. And with that, I would encourage you in closing to realize that proper preaching is based on the boldness that we have in knowing that what we are saying is true and right and good. We should preach the gospel of grace with boldness. Not, well, I don't know, maybe it's true, who knows. No, we should preach with boldness, knowing that what we're saying is right. And with that being the case, let's ask the Lord to give us the boldness that we need by the power of his Holy Spirit so that we can accomplish his great commission. And then with the strength of the Holy Spirit, we can preach the gospel with biblical boldness as we help every unbeliever to understand that God isn't willing that any should perish, but desires all to come to repentance so that every sinner might be saved. It's for this reason that he sent Jesus Christ to die for our sins because he doesn't want to send people to hell. People must choose themselves to go to hell by rejecting the grace of God, which is received by faith in Jesus Christ. And it's for this reason that he's called us, his church, to go and preach the everlasting gospel of grace to every single person so that sinners just like us might avoid the righteous wrath of God by faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let's go and let's preach the gospel of grace so that some might be saved.